um, so uh, I did want to borrow just uh, as a slight nod to uh, Steve Jobs. Um, we, our group kind of represents everybody else. I mean, you've heard a lot of science, you've heard a lot of work from people from uh, uh, very technical and very important uh, parts of uh, our research community. Um, we like to think of ourselves as being the, the folks who deal with the, the rest of us. So we're the computing and technology for the rest of us. Which is not to say that we're not also part of this because um, as, uh, as we've been described, we are, uh, uh, while we are the geekiest people in the, um, in, in the arts and humanities space, we are the least geeky at CCT. Which is not to say that we're not geeky. We are. Um, but. Uh, no, 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 no. We're pretty geeky. I, I, I think, uh, I, I think we'll, we'll, we'll accept that. Um, so I, when Joel asked me to say how, you know, the past of, uh, past of Avatar, past, present, future, um, Brig, of course, challenged me. Uh, so this is our past. This is a 30,000 year old uh, flute carved from a, bone, uh, from a bird bone. Um, and I just happened to pick that up. Uh, pardon? You tripled our date. I tripled our date. So yeah, but um, but but getting more computational, um, this is uh, this is Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, who you may not think of as being a great computational scientist, but in fact, toyed or or at least purported to toy with computational methods for cr for composing music. Uh, he is um, purported to have composed or composed a piece of music that you would go home and you would roll dice, and the dice would determine which piece which fragments of music you would play in which order and that would be your piece of music and um, uh, uh, we don't know exactly who composed this but it is attributed to Mozart um, uh, and then uh, using similar technologies this is the um, anybody recognize this it's a little bit a little bit more recent uh, you, you've got it yes yeah, the iliac so this is the Iliac uh, uh, 2, actually, um, uh, from, uh, from Illinois, where, um, uh, where Leonard Isaacson and um, uh, LeJar and Hiller um, did a, a lot of work on modeling uh, music composition using Markov chains and Markov models. And, and um, LeJar and Hiller is credited with the first piece of computer music for string quartet. But that's really not the past that we want to be talking about. We really want to talk about the origins of Avatar, the origins of the cultural computing efforts and digital media here. And it really starts, I suppose it starts when I came to campus in 1988, but really our first big collaborative project was called the Music and Art Digital Studio. It was a collaboration between myself uh, and Michael Doherty, who at the time was the director of the School of Art. Uh, he was also a sculptor and was heavily involved with 3D, um, uh, 3D animation and 3D modeling. Um, and he and I put together uh, uh, over the course of nine years five successful um, Board of Regents grants totaling a half million dollars. Now in the science world that's not a whole lot of money but believe me for us starving artists half a million over nine years buys a lot of good toys. Um, one of them actually uh, uh, just to kind of put things in perspective we were talking about this with a, co a colleague of mine one was we built in 1998 we built a um, a small network uh, uh, server for doing digital media uh, for both music and, ar and artists. Uh, we spent $10,000 to get the latest and greatest um, uh, uh, hard drive uh, RAID array. It was, it was 100 gigabytes for $10,000. And I now have a 12 terabyte store on my desk side that's completely silent. Um, in 2002, 2003, Joel had asked me to put together a proposal, um, a prospectus, if you will, to, to create a, uh, a unit within LSU Capital that would focus on digital technologies for creativity. Um, it was, uh, a, a, it, it had a variety of test names. The one we ended up with was the Lab for Creative Arts and Technologies, which uh, which was part, made part of CCT uh, when, when Ed Seidel came here. Um, and then in 2008, that effort and, and the various iterations within the center grew into what we now call Avatar, which is the Arts Visualization Advanced Technologies and Research Initiative in Digital Media. Um, 
We've had many names, so just so that people, you might see old remnants of other names around. So uh, we started off, uh, as Joel mentioned, the Creative Technologies Lab, then there was the LCAT, then there was VITA, then there was Cultural Computing, uh, and then finally uh, Avatar. And we really kind of settle on Avatar and Cultural Computing because Cultural Computing is an important part of what we do, but it's not the whole sum of the digital media effort. We're really interested, um, uh, uh, while we have focus, people focus heavily on digital media, we are very interested in, and we, we, we think of ourselves as being the gateway to all of the arts and humanities in terms of computing, um, computational research, and I'll get to that at the end of my talk a little bit in terms of the, 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 the future. Um, the, the initiative itself, has four identified domains um, uh, or uh, uh, disciplines. Uh, we're looking at computer music, digital art and design, computer graphics, and interactive systems. And you might notice that each one of them by its very nature is interdisciplinary and usually across the great boundary that C.P. Snow described as from the two cultures. Um, we ignore that boundary. Um, we, we don't think of ourselves as being an arts boundary and a technology boundary. It's all one big group. Um, and, and because of this, we have faculty in six different departments. Uh, music, art, mass comm, computer science, ECE, and English. And soon to be five departments, but that's not our fault. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, did I say that? I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, and, and here's a list of our faculty. Again, no, no affiliations so that you, you don't know, I mean, you, you all know who's where. But, but the idea is, is that we, we really are trying to look at ourselves um, as a group of people all focused on a particular t kinds of set of technologies and, and results where ultimately we allow we, we enable people to express themselves creatively. Whether that expression is artistic or scientific, or in the case of the humanities, uh, 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 cultural. Um, but we also have some additional faculty who are are either part of cultural computing or are affiliated with what we do because they've just come to us and said, hey, I really like what you're doing and we want to be involved. So Ram uh, Ramanujam, uh, Rudy Hirschheim from within CCT, and we have four faculty from outside of CCT who, we, who have been involved with some of the planning that we're doing and some of the work that we're involved with, and they've been very helpful. Some of our early initiatives have involved computation directly. So NEMO was our first foray into large-scale computing for the arts and humanities. It was a 64 processor uh, XServe cluster. Um, Apple went bananas when we announced it. They thought it was the greatest thing since sliced bread. Turns out it wasn't quite the greatest thing since sliced bread, but that's okay. It was still fun to have. It was retired in 2009, gracefully. Um, but uh, uh, it's, it's always been a very fond part of our work. We, we were doing experiments with both art, um, uh, audio computing, distributed audio computing, graphics rendering. Uh, uh, the art department used it for a while for doing some uh, Maya uh, visualizations. Um, we've had students doing work, uh, a variety of different things, and it was also tasked in, uh, for doing um, basic uh, uh, multi-core computations uh, in the sciences world. Uh, Katrina happened not long after we got started, and in fact, uh, literally, uh, about a year before Katrina happened, we were having conversations with some of the folks at the, at the Hurricane Center saying, could, you, could we visualize what would happen if, heaven forbid, a, a levee broke? How would it, could we show how high the water would get in downtown, like next to a building in downtown New Orleans? Um, and of course we said, well, we can't be that granular in it. We couldn't get that specific in it, but, but we did start talking about that and then Katrina happened and we didn't have to. We had the real pictures. It was actually quite eye-opening. We did a lot of processing of that. But we also, we decided after that that we would try to do something that would help explain what, how, how the situation became possible that the levees would fail. Um, and so we took a variety of different kinds of data sources that were not synced, and we know that they weren't synced, but they, they when we put them together and tried to align them visually, 
that, uh, and temporally, that it made, some, it, it made some sense as to what was actually happening. And so we, we created this visualization and actually created a short movie from it. Um, I'll show you a little bit of that. Maybe, oh, no. My favorite one. Okay. Anyway, um, I, it's about uh, seven minutes long, but um, it gives you the idea that, that you know, you think of a, a tornado. We can get our heads around a tornado because we can see the whole tornado. As human beings, we cannot get our heads around uh, a hurricane as a whole, as, as an entity, because it's just too big. We just can't do it. But this, these visualizations, I think, really were the start of trying to find ways to help explain to people how all of these things come together and how the, how the confluence of all, this, of all of these activities uh, happen. And this was due, large part, Werner Banger did a lot, did, uh, uh, a lot of the visualizations. Shalini Venkatraman uh, was involved, Amanda Long, myself. Who else? Am I forgetting somebody? Pardon? Yeah, so that was the core part. So that was that was that was one of our, our first projects, but it was one that we just did on our own, and 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 it, it was really a proof of concept that we can we can make things that are important. They may not be as scientifically accurate as 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 we would want to put in the Journal of Nature, but it still did the job of communicating the ideas, and that's really what we were trying to to to, to get to. Um, Moving on to Red Stick, so um, a, a lot of people think we're just doing the animation festival because we have a big animation department and we're really excited about it. Well, the re reality is we don't have an animation department. We don't, I mean, we like animation technologies, but that's not where the festival came from. It actually started when, um, when, when I came on board and Stacy Simmons came on board as the assistant director for, for our lab. Um, we started thinking, you know, five years from that point, which was 2004, five years from now, we're going to have to explain to uh, the legislature why they need to keep investing in high-performance computing. And, 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 and you know, we, we were trying to come up with some kind of community event to help build a sense of community that we could, so that, so that there would be a constituency to say, yes, we have to keep CCT going, we have to keep this going. And it just so happened that the year before, when we were in Los Angeles, we met with Ed Leonard, who was the, I think still is, the Vice President for Technology at DreamWorks. Um, and we were talking about Shrek. Do you remember that? 
conversation we were talking. Shrek 2 had just come out. Finding Nemo had just come out. Shrek had come out the year before. And we had just launched Super Mike. 300 processors. That's what it took to make Shrek. I thought, wow, we could do that. And so that's when we said, well, what about animation? All of these guys downtown, half of them don't have college degrees, but all of their kids and grandkids know who Nemo is and they know who Shrek is. So we thought, let's build a festival that, start, that tries to tie in creativity and technology as a vehicle for building a community within Baton Rouge and within the state. Um, and uh, uh, so we did, and it was actually quite successful. I, I, I would hope so. Um, but we also met up with another group um, out of Middlesbrough, England, um, who was also it was a University of Teesside that was also doing the exact same thing that we were doing, but they were trying to take their program and their festival and turn it into economic development by building a digital media sector around that that university and around that school and we thought wow what a great idea and so that's when we went, came back and we brought the city and the foundation, uh, Baton Rouge Area Foundation and the chamber and we said we have to partner on this we have to come together and they said you know that's not a bad idea and so we established what we now know as Braddock the Baton Rouge Area Digital Industries Consortium I think Amanda is going to talk a little bit a little bit Okay, about that. But um, essentially, it's the efforts from Braddock that, that successfully brought EA to campus and, and helped. And from EA being on campus came the building and, and has come a lot of additional kinds of activity, economic activity, uh, in the digital media community. And I think that it's safe to say that in five years' time, Baton Rouge will have a thriving digital media economy uh, uh, in, in this region. And that will be, will be the leading part of that. So in addressing that aspect of economic development, we realized we have to take our research activities and convert it into educational activities as well. And so over the past uh, eight, uh, seven years, eight years, uh, we've uh, formulated a couple of, of initiatives. First, we've established an undergraduate minor in digital media. This has been going on, we're coming up on the, uh, about a year and a half, we have 50 majors, uh, 50 minors in the program uh, across 10 different college, uh, 10 different uh, academic programs. Um, it's split into art-centric and technology-centric, but they all take roughly the same kinds of courses, um, and it ends up in a capstone. It's, uh, so far, we're very excited uh, with it, um, and we couldn't be happier with it. Um, in the same time period, two graduate programs have been established on campus where we had an influence, and um, we, we didn't create them, but we certainly were part of the formula for why they were created. One is the, the MFA in Digital Art through the School of Art uh, and the PhD in uh, Experimental Music and Digital Media at the School of Music. Uh, we are currently working on an idea that we're calling the Center for Excellence in Video Game Development where we want to take a lot of our effort and focus it on the development of a game curriculum at the master's level. This would be a terminal master's degree. Um, we're working, we've got a, a, a committee of a group, a, a bunch of us from CCT who have been doing some preliminary research. Uh, uh, Joel's been uh, uh, a driving force behind that and uh, we're, we're very uh, appreciative of the support for it. And we hope that uh, by the end of this year we'll have a Master of Science uh, uh, an engineering science focused on game development, game design, uh, ready to go and uh, uh, for accepting students. So we're very excited about that aspect. And then both um, Brig and uh, Jesse Allison uh, have been taking the lead on our iOS uh, development efforts uh, for the center. Um, and this again gets into uh, kind of the, the aspect of our group which is Giving, enabling people to express themselves through either a creative or scientific or intellectual means and, and these kinds of low-cost devices are the vehicle that everyone's using. Um, so we're very, uh, so that's been a, an important part of, of all of this. Um, 
So uh, our research really is in a variety of different areas. I'm going to highlight a few things. I'm not going to go through everything because there's just not enough time. I'm already late. Um, but, uh, 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 and Briggs already taken the... Um, uh, the lead on some of that. Um, but I, just to let you know, because uh, Joel put up some formulas, here's a formula that we use. This is the wave, equa the, the wave equation for audio. Um, but, but we have time scale problems. We have to be computing things on the order of 44,000 to 192,000 samples per second. And there can't be any, there's so, the, 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 the delta for error is so small um, without creating uh, distortion and, uh, and uh, uh, things that you can actually uh, hear. And our resolution are between 16 and uh, 16 and 64 bit um, so we have our own computation problems they're not quite as big as Joel's are or, or some of the others that we need but we do have a few um, so some of the, the uh, just kind of in general some of the uh, uh, activities that we have going on. The Laptop Orchestra of Louisiana um, is a computational grid for music um, where we're using a loosely coupled collection of, of uh, computers driven towards a common solution. It just happens the common solution is making music. Um, but we've been using grid tools to help facilitate the way in which the, the uh, uh, pieces are written, the way we interact on stage, the way we perform and rehearse. Um, and we're using all different kinds of low-cost uh, tools to interact, whether we're use, actually using the laptops themselves or some kind of uh, commodity um, controller, uh, Wiimotes, iPads, webcams. Uh, it, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, here's a video of a work. I'm going to turn this down a little bit. Um, this is an installation piece that Jesse Allison did uh, with a couple of grad students called Social Structure. Um, these are uh, acrylic boxes. They have little infrared sensors. There's an infrared camera on the other side that's looking at the infrared sensors and saying, oh, there's a box here. I'll project something onto it. Um, if you notice, the, the, as you move the boxes, the, the images will follow with it. Um, there are also little transducers in the acrylic boxes that create sound. They actually route a sound signal from that base through the boxes, through some connectors in the boxes. So the more boxes you have, the louder it sounds and the more things that it does. It's a lot of fun. Um, and this just was just presented at Pixelerations, one of the uh, largest uh, uh, new media festivals in the country at uh, the Rhode Island School of Design. It's a lot of fun. I'd love to just let this go, but I'm out of time. So. Um, Bob Coyma's group has been doing a lot of work with, um, with 3D uh, televisions. Where's Bob? I just saw him. Uh, there he is. Um, so this is, uh, I'll, I'll play this as well. Um, so you can see what, what's going on. But essentially, he's using a, um, he's just using a, uh, uh, a connect um, to do the, fi the, the, the kind of body tracking and head tracking that would cost $20,000 uh, five years ago, or maybe even three years ago. Um, and, and using a $150 Kinect to do the same thing to create a uh, immersive environment using a 3D television. Uh, but Bob's work group is also working on large-scale uh, gigapixel size imagery, uh, both three-dimensional, two-dimensional, spherical projections, and it's just loads of fun. And he's got a demo of that outside. So I, if you haven't seen it, go see it because it's, it's uh, really cool. Um, uh, I've been working on a Kinect synthesizer. I'm going to see if I can just get this going really quickly um, to see if it will work. Um, nope. And um, so, so the way that it works is that there's a um, there's a, a depth map, and as I'm and. It's telling me how, that I'm getting close to the edge. There's a kind of virtual curtain. As soon as I move my hand through the curtain, it'll make a sound. And it tracks, and, but it's also polyphonic. So it's, you have a polyphonic theremin, but we can also just change the sound very quickly to a string, pluck string. And you've got, you've got a virtual harp. And we've got, this is in the way. Well, something like that. Anyway, okay. So I'm running out of time now, and we'll go to, we'll go back here. Um, I won't say anything about Briggs' tangible interaction because he's just said everything we need to know about tangible inter interaction. Uh, but it's really great stuff, and we're very excited about it. Um, I did want to give a little bit of perspective of then 
and now and the future. So this was then, that's, that actually is a great picture of Lajarn Hiller and John Cage. For those of you who are into new media art, John Cage, really important American composer, um, working with uh, Hiller on a variety of things. That's the old uh, Iliac. Um, and that's the YMP that Brig was talking about. And these two devices are more powerful than all of that combined. Steve Jobs was, is, is quoted as, as saying in, a, in an Apple meeting, walking into a meeting one day with his executives, bringing out a prototype of an iPod and saying, imagine all of humanity's creation on this device. And then he just left the room. And then we have the iPod. But the, but the point is, is that we have the opportunity to put our culture and make it available to everyone, everywhere, and make it completely searchable and interconnected. That's what our group is trying to look at. The future of music computing. Um, th this is some stuff that was done at Honda, some robot uh, violin and robot conductors, but we actually have robot musicians already. This is Pat Metheny with the robot orchestra that he plays with that was created by Eric Singer um, and the League of Urban uh, Lemur, League of Emerging Musical Robots, something like that. Um, the future of, of cultural computing really is about engaging uh, computational research across all domains within the arts and humanities in the same way that science has been uh, uh, has been just completely engaged with computation as a methodology for research the arts and humanities are starting in that same direction and it's really important for us to be to be communicating this notion of computational thinking in in every form of arts and humanities research um, moving from as we say stem to STEAM, where the A is, a is arts in the, the equation of science, technology, uh, engineering, and mathematics. Um, that that's a really important part of what we're trying to do, and, it's, and it will be a, a, a kind of uh, a focal point for us for the next uh, few years. Um, we honestly believe that in the same way that English is fundamental to a university education, Computational thinking, computer science, computer engineering will be fundamental to every discipline in the university. And we take it as, as or I see it as our, as our mission within CCT to be the leaders uh, and, and the drivers for that transition. Thank you.